Audio reading presents The World with a Thousand Moons by Edmund Hamilton. Grim death was the only romance to be found on this world that boasted a thousand moons. Chapter 1 Thrill Cruise Lance Keniston felt the cold realization of failure as he came out of the building into the sharp chill of the Martian night. He stood for a moment, his lean, drawn face haggard in the light of the two hurtling moons. He looked hopelessly across the dark spaceport. It was a large one, for this ancient town of Sirtis was the main port of Mars. The forked light of the flying moon showed many ships docked on the tarmac, a big liner. Several freighters, a small, shining cruiser and other small craft. And for lack of one of those ships, his hopes were ruined. A squat, brawny figure in shapeless space jacket came to Keniston's side. It was Hokor, the Jovian who had been waiting for him. What luck? asked the Jovian in a rumbling whisper. It's hopeless, Keniston answered heavily. There isn't a small cruiser to be had at any price. The meteor miners buy up all small ships here. The devil, muttered Hokor, dismayed. What are we going to do? Go on to Earth and get a cruiser there. We can't do that, Keniston answered. You know we've got to get back to that asteroid within two weeks. We've got to get a ship here. Desperation made Keniston's voice talk. His lean, hard face was bleak with knowledge of disastrous failure. The big Jovian scratched his head. In the shifting moonlight, his battered green face expressed ignorant perplexity as he stared. Across the busy spaceport, that shiny little cruiser there would be just the thing, Hokor muttered, looking at the gleaming, torpedo-shaped craft nearby. It would hold all the stuff we've got to take. And with robot controls we too could run it. We haven't a chance to get that craft, Keniston told him. I found out that it's under charter to a bunch of rich earth youngsters who came out here in it for a pleasure cruise. A girl named Loring, heiress to Loring Radium, is the head of the party. The Jovian swore, just the ship we need, and a lot of spoiled kids are using it for thrill hunting. Keniston had an idea. It might be, he said slowly, that they're tired of the cruise by this time and would sell us the craft. I think I'll go up to the Terra Hotel and see this Loring girl. Sure, let's try it anyway. Hokor agreed. The Earthman looked at him anxiously. Oughtn't you to keep undercover, Hok? The Planet Patrol has had your record on file for a long time. If you happen to be recognized. Bah, they think I'm dead, don't they? Scoffed the Jovian. There's no danger of us getting picked up. Keniston was not so sure, but he was too driven by urgent need to waste time in argument. With the Jovian clumping along beside him, he made his way from the spaceport across the ancient Martian city. The dark streets of old Sirtis were not crowded. Martians are not a nocturnal people and only a few were abroad in the chill darkness. Even they being wrapped in heavy synth wool cloaks from which only their bald red heads and solemn, cadaverous faces protruded. Earthmen were fairly numerous in this main port of the planet. Swaggering space sailors, prosperous looking traders and rough meteor miners made up the most of them. There were a few tourists gaping at the grotesque old black stone buildings and under a krypton bulb at a corner, two men in the drab uniform of the patrol stood eyeing passers be sharply. Keniston breathed more easily when he and the Jovian had passed the two officers without challenge. T. Hitera Hotel stood in a garden at the edge of town, fronting the moonlit immensity of the desert. This glittering glass block, especially built to cater to the tourist trade from Earth, was Earth-conditioned inside. Its gravitation, Air pressure and humidity were ingeniously maintained at Earth standards for the greater comfort of its patrons. Keniston felt oddly oppressed by the warm, soft air inside the resplendent lobby. He had spent so much of his time away from Earth that he had become more or less adapted to thinner, colder atmospheres. Miss Gloria Loring repeated the immaculate young Earthman behind the information desk. His eyes appraised Keniston's shabby space jacket and the hulking green Jovian. I am afraid. I'm here to see her on important business, by appointment, Keniston snapped. The clerk melted at once. Oh, I see. I believe that Miss Loring's party is now in the bridge. That's our cocktail room, top floor. Keniston felt badly out of place, riding up in the magnetic lift with Hokor. The other people in the car, earthmen and women in the shimmering synthesis of the latest formal dress, stared at him and the Jovian as though wondering how they had ever gained admittance. The lights, Silks and perfumes made Keniston feel even shabbier than he was. All this luxury was a far cry from the hard, 
dangerous life he had led for so long amid the wild asteroids and moons of the outer planets. It was worse up in the glittering cocktail room atop the hotel. The place had glassite walls and ceiling, and was designed to give an impression of the navigating bridge of a spaceship. The orchestra played behind a phony control board of instruments and rocket controls. Meaningless space charts hung on the walls for decoration. It was just the sort of pretentious sham, Keniston thought contemptuously, to appeal to tourists. Some crowd, muttered Hokor, looking over the tables of richly dressed and jeweled people. His small eyes gleamed. What a place to loot. Shut up, Keniston muttered hastily. He asked a waiter for the luring party, and was conducted to a table in a corner. There were a half dozen people at the table, most of them young earthmen and girls. They were drinking pink Martian dessert wine, except for one sulky-looking youngster who had stuck to earth whiskey. One of the girls turned and looked at Keniston with cool, insolently uninterested gaze when the waiter whispered to her politely. I'm Gloria Loring, she drawled. What did you want to see me about? She was dark and slim, and surprisingly young. There were almost childish lines to the bare shoulders revealed by her low golden gown. Her thoroughbred grace and beauty were spoiled for Keniston. By the bored look in her clear dark eyes and the faintly disdainful droop of her mouth, the chubby, rosy youth beside her goggled in simulated amazement and terror at the battered green Jovian, behind Keniston. He set down his glass with a theatrical gesture of horror. This Martian liquor has got me, he exclaimed. I can see a little green man. Hokor started wrathfully forward. Why, that young pup. Keniston hastily restrained him with a gesture. He turned back to the table. Some of the girls were giggling. Be quiet, Robbie, Gloria Loring was telling the chubby young comedian. She turned her cool gaze back to Keniston. Well, Miss Loring, I heard down at the spaceport that you are the charter of that small cruiser, the Sub Sprite, Keniston explained. I need a craft like that very badly. If you would part with her, I'd be glad to pay almost any price for your charter. T. He girl looked at him in astonishment. Why in the world should I let you have our cruiser? Keniston said earnestly, your party could travel just as well and a lot more comfortably by liner. And getting a cruiser like that is a life or death business for me right now. I'm not interested in your business, Mr. Keniston, drawled Gloria Loring. And I certainly don't propose to alter our plans just to help a stranger out of his difficulties. Keniston flushed from the cool rebuke. He stood there, suddenly feeling a savage dislike for the whole pampered group of them. Beside that, the girl continued, we chose the cruiser for this trip, because we wanted to get off the beaten track of liner routes, and see something new. We're going from here out to Jupiter's moons. Keniston perceived that these bored, spoiled youngsters were out here hunting for new thrills on the interplanetary frontier. His dislike of them increased. A clean-cut, Sober-faced young man who seemed older and more serious than the rest of the party was speaking to the heiress. Unhardened space travelers like us are likely to get hit by gravitation paralysis out. In the outer planets, Gloria, he was saying to the heiress. I don't think we ought to go farther out than Mars. Gloria looked at him mockingly. If you're scared, Hugh, why did you leave your nice safe office on Earth and come along with us? The chubby youth called Robbie laughed loudly. We all know why Hugh Murdoch came along. It's not thrills he wants, it's you, Gloria. They were all ignoring Keniston now. He felt that he had been dismissed, but he was desperately reluctant to lose his last hope of getting a ship. Somehow he must get that cruiser. A stratagem occurred to him. If these spoiled scions wouldn't give up their ship, at least he might induce them to go where he wanted. Keniston hesitated. It would mean leading them all into the deadliest kind of peril. But a man's life depended on it. A man who was worth all these rich young wastrels put together. He decided to try it. Miss Loring, if it's thrills you're after, maybe I can furnish them, Keniston said. Maybe we can team up on this. How would you like to go on a voyage after the biggest treasure in the system? Treasure, exclaimed the heiress surprisedly. Where is it? They were all leaning forward, with quick interest. Keniston saw that his bait had caught them. You've heard of John Dark, the notorious space pirate. He asked. Gloria nodded. Of course. The telenews was full of his exploits until the patrol caught and destroyed his ship a few weeks ago. Keniston corrected her. The patrol caught up to John Dark's ship in the asteroid, but didn't completely destroy it. They gunned the pirate craft to a wreck in a running fight. 
but Dark's wrecked ship drifted into a dangerous zone of meteor swarms where they couldn't follow. I remember now, that's what the Telenews said, conceded the heiress. But Dark and his crew were undoubtedly killed, they said. John Dark, Keniston went on, looted scores of ships during his career. He amassed a hoard of jewels and precious metals. And he kept it right with him in his ship. That treasure is still in that lost wreck. How do you know? asked Hugh Murdoch bluntly. Because I found the lost wreck of Dark Ship myself, Keniston answered. He hated to lie like this, but knew that he had no choice. H. He plunged on. I'm a meteor miner by profession. Two weeks ago my Jovian partner and I were prospecting in the outer asteroid zone in our little rocket. Our air tanks got low and to replenish them, we landed on the asteroid Vesta. That's the big asteroid they call the world with a thousand moons, because it's circled by a swarm of hundreds of meteors. It's a weird, jungled little world, inhabited by some very queer forms of life. In landing, my partner and I noticed where some great object had crashed down into the jungle. We discovered it was the wreck of John Dark's ship. The wreck had drifted until it crashed on Vesta, almost completely burying itself in the ground. No one was alive on it, of course. Keniston concluded, we knew Dark's treasure must still be in the buried wreck, but it would take machinery and equipment to dig out the wreck. So we came here to Mars, intending to get a small cruiser, load it with the necessary equipment, and go back to Veste and lift the treasure. Only we haven't been able to get a ship of any kind. He leaned toward the girl. Here's my proposition, Miss Loring. You take us and our equipment to Vesta in your cruiser, and we'll share the treasure with you 50-50. What do you say? The blonde girl beside Gloria uttered a squeal of excitement. Pirate treasure, Gloria, let's do it, what a thrill it would be. The others showed equal excitement. The romance of a treasure hunt in the wild asteroids lured them, rather than the possible rewards. We'd certainly be able to take back a wonderful story to Earth if we found John Dark's treasure, admitted Gloria, with quick, eager interest. Hugh Murdoch was an exception to the general enthusiasm. He asked Keniston, how do you know the treasure's still in the buried wreck? Because the wreck was still undisturbed, Keniston answered. And because we found these jewels on the body of one of John Dark's crew, who had been flung clear somehow when the wreck crashed. He held out a half dozen gems he took from his pocket. They were Saturnian moonstones, softly shining white jewels whose brilliance waxed and waned in perfect periodic rhythm. These jewels, Keniston said, must have been that pirate's share of the loot. You can imagine how rich John Dark's own hoard must be. The jewels, worth many thousands, swept away the lingering incredulity of the others as Keniston had known they would. You're sure no one else knows the wreck is there? Gloria asked breathlessly. We kept our find absolutely secret, Keniston told her. But since I can't get a ship any other way, I'm willing to share the hoard with you. If I wait too long, someone else may find the wreck. I accept your proposition, Mr. Keniston, Gloria declared. We'll start for Vesta just as soon as you can get the equipment you'll need loaded on the sun sprite. Gloria, you're being too hasty, protested Hugh Murdoch. I've heard of this world with a thousand moons. There are stories of queer and human creatures they call Vestans who infest that asteroid. The danger. Gloria impatiently dismissed his objections. Hugh, if you are going to start worrying about dangers again, you'd better go back to Earth and safety. Murdoch flushed and was silent. Keniston felt a certain sympathy for the young businessman. He knew, if these others did not, just how real was the alien menace of those strange creatures, the Vestans. I'll go right down to the spaceport and see about loading the equipment aboard your cruiser, Keniston told the heiress. You'd better give me a note to your captain. We ought to be able to start tomorrow. Pirate treasure on an unexplored asteroid, exulted the enthusiastic Robbie. Ho for the world with a thousand moons. Keniston felt guilty when he and Hoke or left the big hotel. These youngsters, he thought, hadn't the faintest idea of the peril into which he was leading them. They were as ignorant as babies of the dark evil and unearthly danger of the interplanetary frontier. He hardened himself against the qualms of conscience. There was that at stake, he told himself fiercely, against which. The safety of a lot of spoiled, rich young people was absolutely nothing. Hoke War was chuckling as they emerged into the chill Martian night. He told Keniston admiringly, that was one of the smoothest jobs of lying I ever heard, that story about finding John Dark's treasure. Take it from me, it was slick. The Jovian guffawed loudly as he added, 
What would their faces be like if they knew that John Dark and his crew are still living? That it was John Dark himself who sent us here. Be quiet, you idiot, ordered Keniston hastily. Do you want the whole patrol to hear you? Chapter 2 Discovered The sun's bright throbbed steadily through the vast, dangerous wilderness of the asteroidal zone. To the eye, the cruiser moved in a black void starred by creeping crumbs of light. In reality, those bright, crawling specks were booming asteroids or whirling meteor swarms, rushing in complicated, unchartable orbits and constantly threatening destruction. For three days now, the cruiser had cautiously groped deeper into this most perilous region of the system. Now a bright, tiny disk of white light was shining far ahead like a beckoning beacon. It was the asteroid Vesta, their goal. Keniston, leaning against the glassite deck wall, somberly eyed the distant asteroid. We'll reach it by tomorrow, he thought. Then what, I suppose John Dark will hold these rich youngsters for ransom. Keniston knew that the pirate leader would instantly see the chance of extorting vast sums by holding this group of wealthy young people as captives. I wish to God I hadn't had to bring them into this, Keniston sweated. But what else could I do? It was the only way I could get back to Vesto with the materials. His mind was going back over the disastrous events since the day three weeks before, when the patrol had caught up to John Dark at last. Dark's pirate ship, the Falcon, had been gunned to a helpless wreck. It had, fortunately for the pirates, drifted off into a region of perilous meteor swarms where the patrol cruisers dared not follow. The patrol thought everybody on the pirate ship dead anyway, Keniston knew. But John Dark and most of his crew were still alive in the drifting wreck. They had fought the battle wearing spacesuits, and that had saved them. They had clung grimly to the wreck as it drifted on and on until it finally fell into the feeble, gravitational pull of Vesta. Keniston could still remember those tense hours when the wreck had fallen. Through the satellite swarm of meteors onto the world with a thousand moons, they had managed to cushion their crash. John Dark, always the most resourceful of men, had managed to jury-rig makeshift rocket tubes that had softened the impact of their fall. But the wrecked falcon had been marooned there in the weird asteroidal jungle, with the alien, menacing vestons already gathering around it. The ship would never fly space again, until major repairs were made. And they could not be made until quantities of material and equipment were brought. Someone must go for those materials to Mars, the nearest planet. John Dark had superintended construction of a little two-man rocket from parts of the ship. Keniston and Hoke were to go in it. You must be back with that list of equipment and materials within two weeks, Keniston, Dark had emphasized. If we stay cast away here longer than that, either the Vestons will get us or the patrol discover us. The pirate leader had added, the moon jewels I've given you will more than pay for a small cruiser, if you can buy one at Mars. If you can't buy one, get one any way you can, but get back here quickly. Well, Keniston thought grimly, he had got a cruiser in the only way he could. Down in its hold were the Brilloi plates and spare rocket tubes and new cyclotrons he had had, loaded aboard at Sirdis. But he was also bringing back to Vesto with him a bunch of thrill-seeking. Rich, young people who believed they were going on a romantic treasure hunt. What would they think of him when they discovered how he had betrayed them? T. Hats Vesta, isn't it? Spoke a girl's eager voice behind him, interrupting his dark thoughts. Keniston turned quickly. It was Gloria Loring, boyish in silk and space slacks, her hands thrust into the pockets. There was a naive eagerness in her clear, lovely face as she looked toward the distant asteroid. That made her look more like an excited small girl than like the bored, jeweled heiress of that night at Sirdis. Yes, that's the world with a thousand moons, Keniston nodded. We'll reach it by tomorrow. I've just been up on the bridge, telling your Captain Walls the safest route through the meteor swarms. Her dark eyes studied him curiously. You've been out here on the frontier a long time, haven't you? Twelve years, he told her. That's a long time in the outer planets. Most spacemen don't last that long out here, wrecks, accidents, or gravitation paralysis gets them. Gravitation paralysis. She repeated, I've heard of that as a terrible danger to space travelers, but I don't really know what it is. It's the most dreaded danger of all out here, Keniston answered. A paralysis that hits you when you change from very weak to very strong gravities or vice versa. Too often. It locks all your muscles rigid by numbing the motor nerves. Gloria shivered. That sounds ghastly. It is, Keniston said somberly. I've seen scores of my friends stricken down by it, 
in the years I've sailed the outer system. I didn't know you'd been a space sailor all that time, the heiress said wonderingly. I thought you said you were a meteor miner. Keniston woke up to the fact that he had made a bad slip. He hastily covered up, you have to be a good bit of a space sailor to be a meteor miner, Miss Loring. You have to cover a lot of territory. He was thankful that they were interrupted at that moment by some of the others who came along the deck in a lively, chattering group. Robbie Boone was the center of the group. That chubby, clownish young man, heir to the Atomic Power Corporation millions, had garbed himself in what he fondly believed to be a typical spaceman's outfit. His jacket and slacks were of black synthesic, and he wore a big atom pistol. He, uh, pal, he grinned cherubically at Keniston. When does this here crate of ours jet down at Vesta? If you knew how silly you looked, Robbie, said Gloria devastatingly, trying to dress and talk like an old spaceman. You're just jealous, Robbie defied. I look all right, don't I, Keniston? Keniston's lips twitched. You'd certainly create a sensation if you walked into the spaceman's rendezvous in Jovopolis. Alice Krim, a feather-headed little blonde, eyed Keniston admiringly. You've been to an awful lot of planets, haven't you? She sighed. Turn it off, Alice, said Gloria dryly. Mr. Keniston doesn't flirt. Arthur Lanning, the sulky, handsome youngster who always had a drink in his hand, drawled. Then you've tried him out, Gloria? The heiress dark eyes snapped, but she was spared a reply by the appearance of Mrs. Milsom. That dumpy, fluttery woman, the nominal chaperone of the group, immediately seized upon Keniston as usual. Mr. Keniston, are you sure this asteroid we're going to is safe? She asked him for the hundredth time. Is there a good hotel there? A good hotel there? Keniston was too astounded to answer, for a moment. Aye. Until his mind had risen memory of the savage, choking green jungles of the world with a thousand moons. Of the slithering creatures slipping through the fronds. Of the rustling presence of the dreaded vestants who could never quite be seen. Of the pirate wreck around which John Dark and half a hundred of the system's most hardened outlaws waited. Of course there's no hotel there, Auntie, Gloria said disgustedly. Can't you understand that this asteroid's almost unexplored? Hokor had come up, and the big Jovian had heard. He broke into a booming laugh. A hotel on Vesta, that's a good one. Keniston flashed the big green pirate a warning glance. Robbie Boone was asking him, will there be any good hunting there? Sure there will, Hokor declared. His small eyes gleamed with secret humor. You're going to find lots of adventure there, my lad. When Mrs. Milsom had dragged the others away for the usual afternoon game of Dimension Bridge, the Jovian looked after them, chuckling. This crowd of idiots hadn't ought to have ever left Earth. What a surprise they're going to get on Vesta. They're not such a bad bunch, at bottom, Keniston said half-heartedly. Just a lot of ignorant kids looking for adventure. Bah, you're falling for the luring girl, scoffed Hokor. You'd better keep your mind on John Dark's orders. Keniston made a warning gesture. Cut it, here comes Murdoch. Hugh Murdoch came straight along the deck toward them, and his sober, clean-cut young face wore a puzzled look as he halted before them. Keniston, there's something about this I can't understand, he declared. Yes, what's that, returned Keniston guardedly. He was very much on the alert. Murdoch was not a heedless, gullible youngster like the others. He was, Keniston had learned, an already important official in the Loring Radium Company. From the chaffing the others gave Murdoch, it was evident that the young businessman had joined the party only because he was in love with Gloria. There was something likable about the dog devotion of the sober young man. His very obvious determination to protect Gloria's safety and his intelligence made him dangerous in Keniston's eyes. I was down in the hold looking over the equipment you loaded, Hugh Murdoch was saying, you know, the stuff we're to use to dig out the wreck of Dark Ship. And I can't understand it, there's no digging machinery, but simply a lot of cyclotrons, rocket tubes and spare plates. Keniston smiled to cover the alarm he felt. Don't worry, Murdoch, I loaded just the equipment we'll need. You'll see when we reach Vesta. Murdoch persisted, but I still don't see how that stuff is going to help. It's more like ship repair stores than anything else. Keniston lied hastily the 6R4 power supply, and the rocket tubes and plates, are to build a heavy-duty power hoist to jack the wreck out of the mud. Hoke or and I have got that all figured out. Murdoch frowned as though still unconvinced but dropped the subject. When he had gone off to join the others, Hoke or glared after him. 
That fellow's too smart for his own good, muttered the Jovian. He's suspicious. Maybe I'd better see that he meets with an accident. No, let him alone, warned Keniston. If anything happened to him now, the others would want to turn back. And we're almost to Vesta now. But worry remained as a shadow in the back of Keniston's own mind. It still oppressed him hours later when the arbitrary ship's time had brought the night. Sitting down in the luxurious passenger cabin over highballs with the others, he wondered where Hugh Murdoch was. The rest of Gloria's party were all here, listening with fascinated interest to Hoker's colorful yarns of adventures on the wild asteroids. But Murdoch was missing. Keniston wondered worriedly if the fellow was looking over that equipment in the hold again. Ah, young Earth spaceman, one of the Sunsprite's small crew, came into the cabin and approached. Keniston. Captain Wall's compliments, sir, and would you come up to the bridge? He'd like your advice about the course again. I'll go with you, Gloria said as Keniston rose. I like it up in the bridge best of any place on the ship. As they climbed past the little Taladio transmitter room, they saw Hugh Murdoch standing in there by the operator. He smiled at Gloria. I've been trying to get some messages through to Earth, but it seems we are almost out of range, he said ruefully. Can't you ever forget business, Hugh? The girl said exasperatedly. You're about as adventurous as a fat radium broker of fifty. Keniston, however, felt relieved that Murdoch had apparently forgotten about the oddness of the equipment below. His spirits were lighter when they entered the glassite enclosed bridge. Captain Walls turned from where he stood beside Bray, the chief pilot. The plump, cheerful master touched his cap to Gloria Loring. Sorry to bother you again, Mr. Keniston, he apologized. But we're getting pretty near Vesta and you know this devilish region of space better than I do. The charts are so vague they're useless. Keniston glanced at the instrument panel with a practiced and then squinted at the void ahead. The sun sprite was now throbbing steadily through a starry immensity, whose hosts of glittering points of light would have made a bewildering panorama to layman's eyes. They seemed near none of those blazing sparks. Yet every few minutes, red lights blinked and buzzers sounded on the instrument panel, at each such warning of the meteorometers, the pilot glanced quickly at their direction dials, and then touched the rocket throttles to change course slightly. The cruiser was threading away through unseen but highly perilous swarms of rushing meteors and scores of thundering asteroids. Vesta was now a bright, pale green disk like a little moon. It was not directly ahead, but lay well to the left. The cruiser was following an indirect course that had been laid to deter it well round one of the bigger meteor swarms that was spinning rapidly toward Mars. What about it, Mr. Keniston? Is it safe to turn toward Vesta now? Captain Walls asked anxiously. The chart doesn't show any more swarms that should be in this region now, by my calculations. Keniston snorted. Charts are all made by planet lubbers. There's a small swarm that tags after that big no. 480 mess we just detoured around. Let me have the scopes and I'll try to locate it. Using the meteor scopes whose sensitive electromagnetic beams could probe far out through space. To be reflected by any matter, Keniston searched carefully. He finally straightened from the task. It's all right, the tag swarm is on the far side of no. 480, he reported. It should be safe to blast straight toward Vesta now. The captain's anxiety was only partly assuaged. But when we reach the asteroid, what then? How do we get through the satellite swarm around it? I can pilot you through that, Keniston assured him. There's a periodic break in that swarm, due to gravitational perturbations of the spinning meteor moons. I know how to find it. Then I'll wake you up early tomorrow morning before we reach Vesta, bowed Captain Walls. I've no hankering to run that swarm myself. We'll be there in the morning, exclaimed Gloria with eager delight. How long then will it take us to find the pirate wreck? Keniston uncomfortably evaded the question. I don't know, it shouldn't take long. We can land in the jungle near the wreck. His feeling of guilt was increased by her enthusiastic excitement. If she and the others only knew what the morrow was to bring them. H. He did not feel like facing the rest of them now, and lingered on the dark deck when they went back down from the bridge. Gloria remained beside him instead of going onto the cabin. She stood, with the starlight from the transparent deck wall falling upon her youthful face as she looked up at him. You are a moody creature, you know she told Keniston lightly. Sometimes you're almost human, then you get all dark and grim again. Keniston grinned despite himself. Her voice came in mock surprise. Why, 
it can actually smile. I can't believe my eyes. Her clear young face was provocatively close, the faint perfume of her dark hair in his nostrils. He knew that she was deliberately flirting with him, perhaps mostly out of curiosity. She expected him to kiss her, he knew. Damn it, he would kiss her. He did so, half ironically. But the ironic amusement faded out of his mind somehow, at the oddly shy contact of her soft lips. Why, you're just a kid, he muttered. A little kid masquerading as a bored, sophisticated young lady. Gloria stiffened with anger. Don't be silly, I've kissed men before. I just wanted to find out what you were really like. Well, what did you find out? Her voice softened. I found out that you're not as grim as you look. I think you're just lonely. The truth of that made Keniston wince. Yes, he was lonely enough, he thought somberly. All his old space mates, passing one by one. Don't you have anyone? Gloria was asking him wonderingly. No family, except my kid brother Ricky, he answered heavily. And most of my old space partners are either dead or else worse, lying in the grip of gravitation paralysis. Memory of those old partners re-established Keniston's wavering resolution. He mustn't let them down. He must go through with delivering this cruiser's cargo to John Dark, no matter what the consequences. He thrust the girl almost roughly from him. It's getting late, you'd better turn in like the others. But later, in his bunk in the little cabin he shared with Hokor, Keniston found memory of Gloria a barrier to sleep. The shy touch of her lips refused to be forgotten. What would she think of him by tomorrow? He slept, finally, when he awakened. It was to realization that someone had just sharply spoken his name. He knew drowsily it was morning and thought at first that Captain Walls had sent someone to awaken him. Then he stiffened as he saw who had awakened him. It was Hugh Murdoch. The young businessman's sober face was grim now, and he stood in the doorway of the cabin with a heavy atom pistol in his hand. Get up and dress, Keniston, Murdoch said sternly. And wake up your fellow pirate, too. If you make a wrong move, I'll kill you both. Chapter 3 Through the Meteor Moons Keniston went cold with dismay. He told himself numbly that it was impossible Hugh Murdoch could have discovered the truth. But the grim expression on Murdoch's face and the naked hate in his eyes were explainable on no other grounds. The young businessman's finger was tense on the trigger of the atom pistol. Resistance would be senseless. Mechanically, Keniston slipped from his bunk and threw on his slacks and space jacket. Hoke Orr was doing the same, the big Jovian's battered green face almost ludicrous in astonishment. Now perhaps you'll tell us what this means, Keniston said harshly, his mind racing. Have you lost your senses? I've just come to them, Keniston, rapped Murdoch. What fools we all were, not to guess that you'd belong to Dark's pirates. Keniston's lips tightened. It was clear now that Murdoch had actually discovered something. From Hokor came an angry roar. Devils of Pluto, I'm no pirate, the big Jovian lied magnificently. Whatever gave you this crazy idea? Murdoch's hard face did not relax. He waved the Eden pistol. Go into the main cabin, he ordered. Walk ahead of me. Helplessly, Keniston and Hokor obeyed. His mind was desperate as he shouldered down the corridor. The throbbing of the rockets told him the sun's bright was still forging through the void. They must be very near Vesta by now, and now this had to happen. The others had been awakened by the uproar and streamed into the main cabin after Murdoch and his two prisoners. Keniston glimpsed Gloria, slim in a silken negligee, her dark eyes round with amazement. Hugh, have you gone crazy? She exclaimed stupefiedly. Murdoch answered without looking toward her. I found out the truth, Gloria. These men belonged to John Dark's crew. They were taking us into a trap. Holy smoke, gasped Robbie Boone, his jaw sagging as the chubby youth stared at Keniston and Hokor. They're pirates? I think you must be losing your mind, Gloria stormed at Hugh Murdoch. This is ridiculous. Hokor yawned elaborately. Space sickness hits people in queer ways, Miss Loring, the Jovian told Gloria confidentially. Some it just makes sick, but others it makes delirious. I'm not delirious, and you to know it, Murdoch retorted grimly. He spoke to Gloria and the others, without taking his eyes or the muzzle of his pistol off his two captives. I thought from the first that this Keniston's story of finding the wreck of Dark's ship on Vesta was a thin one, Murdoch declared. And yesterday my suspicions were increased when I went down and looked over the cargo of equipment they brought. It's not equipment to dig out a buried wreck. 
its equipment to repair a damaged ship, John Dark's ship. Suspecting that, last night I sent a teleaudiogram to patrol headquarters at Earth. I gave full descriptions of Keniston and this Jovian and inquired if they had criminal records. An answer came through an hour ago. This fellow Hoke or has a record of criminal piracy as long as your arm, and was definitely known to be one of John Dark's crew. There was an incredulous gasp from the others. Murdoch still grimly watched Keniston and the Jovian as he concluded. The patrol hasn't yet sent through Keniston's record, but it's obvious enough that he's one of Dark's men too. And that his story that he and the Jovian are meteor miners is a flat lie. I can't understand this, muttered young Arthur Lanning, staring. If they're Dark's men, why should they induce us to go to Vesta? Can't you see? Said Hugh Murdoch. John Dark's ship did crash on Vesta after being wrecked. That must be true enough. But Dark and his pirates weren't dead, as the patrol thought. They had to have machines and material to repair their ship. So Dark sent these two men to Mars for the materials. The two couldn't get a ship there any other way, so they made use of our cruiser by selling us that treasure yarn. K. Aniston winced. He knew now that he had underestimated Murdoch, who had put together the evidence quickly when his suspicions were roused. Gloria Loring, looking at Keniston with wide dark eyes, saw the change in his expression. Into her white face came an incredulous loathing. Then it's true, she whispered. You did that you deliberately planned to lead us all into capture. Ah, you're all space struck, growled Hoke or, bluffing to the last. Murdoch spoke over his shoulder. Call Captain Walls, Robbie. No need to, here he comes now, yelped the excited youth. Captain Walls, entering the cabin in urgent haste had eyes only for Keniston in the first moment. Ah, there you are, Mr. Keniston, the captain exclaimed relievedly. I was just coming for you. We've reached Vesta, I've ordered the pilot to slow down, for I want you to pilot us through the swarm. The captain's voice trailed off. His eyes bulged as for the first time he perceived that Murdoch was covering the two men with a gun. We're not going into Vesta, captain, rapped Murdoch. John Dark and his pirates are on the asteroid, alive. Captain Wall's plump face went waxy as he heard the name of the most dreaded Corsair of the system. Dark, living. He stuttered. Good God, you must be joking. Mrs. Milsom, her dumpy figure shivering and her teeth chattering with terror, pointed a finger at Keniston and the Jovian. They're two of the pirates, she shrilled. They might have murdered us all in our beds. I knew this would happen when we left Earth. Keniston's mind was seething with despair as he stood there with hands upraised. His whole desperate plan was ruined at this last moment. He wouldn't let it be ruined. He would get this cargo of machines and materials to John Dark if it meant his life. Turn back at once toward Mars, Captain, Gloria was saying quietly to the stunned officer. Her face was still very pale. Keniston, standing tense, had had an idea. A desperate chance to make a break, in the face of Murdoch's atom gun. The captain had said that he had just ordered the pilot to slow down the sun's bright. In a moment would come the shock of the breaking rocket tubes firing from the bows. That shock came an instant after the wild expedient flashed across Keniston's mind. It was only a jarring vibration through the fabric of the ship, for the pilot knew his business. It staggered them all on their feet for just a moment. But Keniston had been waiting for that moment. As Hugh Murdoch moved his gun arm involuntarily to balance himself, Keniston lunged forward. The bridge, hook, he yelled as he hurled himself. Keniston's shoulder hit the captain and sent him caroming into Murdoch. The two men sprawled on the floor. Hokor, with instant understanding, already had the door of the cabin open. They plunged out into the corridor together. Our only chance is to make the bridge and grab the controls, Keniston cried as they raced down the corridor. We can keep them long enough to land on Vesta. Hiss flash. The crackling blast of the atom gun tore into the lower steps of the ladder up which he and the Jovian frantically climbed. Murdoch was running after them as he fired, and there were shouts of alarm. Keniston and Hoke were burst into the glassite walled bridge. Bray, the pilot, turned for a startled moment from his rocket throttles. Beyond the pilot, the transparent front wall framed a square of black space in which bulked the monstrous sphere of the nearby asteroid, the world with a thousand moons. It loomed up only a few hundred miles away, a big, pale green sphere. Encircled by the vast globular swarm of hundreds on hundreds of gleaming little meteor satellites. Why, what? stammered the pilot, bewildered. Keniston's fist caught his chin, 
and the man sagged to the floor. Bar the door, Hulk, yelled Keniston as he leaped toward the rocket throttles. Hell, there's only a catch, swore the Jovian. He braced his brawny shoulders against the metal door. I can hold it a little while, K. Eniston's hands were flashing over the throttles. The sun sprite was moving at reduced speed toward the meteor-enclosed asteroid. The cruiser shook to the bursting roar of power as he opened up all the tail rockets. It plunged visibly faster toward the deadly swarm round Vesta, picking up speed by the minute. Rocking, creaking, quivering to the dangerous rate of acceleration Keniston was maintaining. The little ship rushed ahead. But now there was loud hammering at the bridge room door. Open up or we'll burn that door down, came Captain Wall's yell. Keniston didn't turn, hunched over the throttles, peering tensely ahead. He was tally estimating speed and direction. His eyes searched frantically for the periodic break in the outer meteors. There was a muffled crackling and the smell of scorched metal flooded the bridge room. A hoarse exclamation of pain came from Hokor. They got my arm through the door, damn them, cursed the Jovian. Hurry, Keniston. Keniston was driving the sun sprite full speed toward the whirling cloud of meteors around the asteroid. He had spotted the break in the cloud, the periodic opening caused by the gravitational influence of another nearby asteroid. It was not a real opening. It was merely a small area in the swarm where the rushing meteors were not so thick, and where a ship had a chance to worm through by careful piloting. Keniston only remotely heard the struggle that Hook or was putting up to hold the door against the hammering crowd outside. His mind was wholly intent on the desperately ticklish piloting at hand. He cut speed and eased the sun sprite down into that thinner area of the meteor swarm. Space around them now seemed buzzing with rushing, brilliant little moons. The meteorometers had gone crazy, blinking and buzzing and ceasing warning, their needles bobbing all over the direction dials. Instruments were useless here, he had to work by sight alone. He eased the cruiser lower through the swarm, his fingers flashing over the throttles. Using quick bursts of the rockets to veer aside from the bright, rushing meteors. Hurry, yelled Hoak or hoarsely again, over the tumult. I can't hold them out much longer. Down and down went the sun sprite through the maze of meteor moons, twisting, turning, dropping ever lower toward the green asteroid. A last gasping shout from Hokor, and the door crashed off its burn through hinges. Keniston, unable to turn from the life or death business of threading the swarm, heard the Jovian fighting furiously. Next moment a hand gripped Keniston's shoulder and tore him away from the controls. It was Murdoch, his eyes blazing, his gun raised. Raise your hands or I'll kill you, Keniston, he cried. Let me go, yelled Keniston, struggling to get back to the throttles. You fool. He had just glimpsed the jagged moonlit rushing obliquely toward them from the left, bulking suddenly big and monstrous. Crash, the shock flung them from their feet, and the sun sprite gyrated crazily in space. There was a blood-chilling shriek of a crushing air from the forepart of the ship, and the slam-slam-slam of the automatic air doors closing, down there. The cruiser's whole bows had been crushed in by the glancing blow of the meteor. Now, ironically, the ship was falling clear of the meteor swarm for Keniston's piloting had almost won through it, before the impact. But the sun sprite was falling helplessly, turning over and over as it plunged down toward the green surface of the jungled asteroid. Um, why God, we're struck, came Captain Wall's thin yell. This is your fault, Murdoch blazed at Keniston. You damned pirates will die for this. Let me at those controls or we'll all die together in five minutes, Keniston cried. We'll crash to smithereens unless I can make a tail tube landing. Heedless of Murdoch's gun, he jumped to the controls. His hands flew over the throttles, firing desperate quick bursts of the tail rocket tubes to bring them out of the spin in which they were falling. The brake rockets in the bow were gone. The ship was crippled, almost impossible to handle and the dark green jungles of Vesta's surface were rushing upward with appalling speed. Keniston's frantic efforts brought the sun sprite out of the spin. By firing the lateral rockets, he kept it falling tail downward. We're goners, yelled someone in the stricken ship. We're going to crash. Air was screaming outside the plummeting ship. Keniston, his hands superhumanly tense on the throttles, mechanically estimated their distance from the oppressing green jungles. He glimpsed a little black lake in the jungle, and near it the big circle of an electrified stockade. He recognized it, John Dark's camp. Then, a thousand feet above the jungle, Keniston's hands jerked open the throttles. The tail rocket spouted fire downward. 
Sickening shock of the sudden check almost hurled him away from the controls. His hands jabbed the throttles in and out with lightning rapidity, checking their further fall with one quick burst after another. A sound of rending branches, a staggering sideways shock that flung him from his feet. A jarring thump, then silence. They had landed. Chapter 4 The Vestons Keniston picked himself up groggily. The others in the bridge had been thrown against walls or floor by the shock, but seemed no more than bruised. Hoke or was nursing his burned arm. But Hugh Murdoch, staggering in a corner, still held his atom pistol trained on Keniston and the Jovian. My God, what a landing, exclaimed Captain Walls, his plump face still white. I thought we were done for. Maybe we still are, Murdoch said grimly. He said savagely to Keniston, you think you've won, don't you? Because you've managed to crash us on this asteroid where your pirate boss is waiting. Listen, Murdoch, Keniston began desperately. Keep your hands up or I'll kill you both, blazed Murdoch. Marched down to the main cabin. Keniston and the Jovian obeyed. The sun sprite was lying sharply canted on its side, and it was difficult to scramble down. Through the tilted passageways and decks to the big main cabin. The cabin was a scene of confusion, for it was impossible to stand upright on its tilted floor. Young Arthur Lanning had been stunned, and Gloria Loring and the scared blonde girl, Alice Krim, were bathing his bruised forehead. Robbie Boone was peering wildly through a porthole at the sunlit tangle of green jungle outside. From Mrs. Milsom came a shrill, steady wail of terror. Stop that screeching, Murdoch told the dumpy dowager brutally. You're not hurt, Gloria, are you others all right? Gloria raised her white face from her task. Only bruised, Hugh. She did not look at Keniston or the big Jovian, as she spoke. Robbie Boone's teeth were chattering. Murdoch, what are we going to do? We're wrecked, on this hellish jungle asteroid. Murdoch paid the frightened, chubby youth no attention. Captain Walls, Gray, and four of the crew were entering the cabin. The captain and pilot had belted on atom pistols. Captain Walls' plump face was paler. Two of the crew were killed and our Taladio wrecked by that meteor, he reported. He glared at Keniston. You damned pirate. You're responsible for this. If you hadn't dragged me away from the controls, the cruiser wouldn't have been struck, Keniston denied. And I'm not a pirate. Murdoch interrupted. We'll settle with those two later, he told the enraged captain. Right now, we'll have to get out of the ship. We can't stay in here until we get it righted on an even keel. Hoke or rumbled a warning. Better be careful about going outside. Those cursed vestins are thick in these jungles. I'll have no advice from you to pirates, flamed the captain. Bray, you and Thorpe keep your guns on them every minute. The heavy main space door was opened. Pale sunlight and warm, steamy air laden with rank scents of strange vegetation drifted in. Outside lay a rock clearing the falling ship had crushed out of the jungle. Captain Walls supervised as they all donned lead sold weight shoes to compensate for the weaker gravity. Then they emerged, young Lanning being supported by Murdoch and Robbie. Keniston and the Jovian were last to emerge, under the watchful guns of their guards. The crew and passengers were looking around with wonder and revulsion. The silvery bulk of the sun sprite lay awkwardly healed on its side. The symmetrical torpedo shape of the cruiser was now badly marred by the crumpled condition of its bow. Ah! Uh, Around them in the thin sunlight rose slender trees whose enormous green leaves grew directly from the trunks. This grotesque forest was made more dense by festoons of writhing snake vines. Weird rootless creepers which crawled like plant serpents from one tree to another. Each stir of wind brought white spore dust down in a shower from the trees. The few living creatures of this forbidding landscape were equally alien. Big white meteor rats scurried on their eight legs through the brush. Phosphorescent flame birds shot through the upper fronds like streaks of fire. In the pale sky overhead, there were ceaseless gleams and flashes of light as the spinning meteor swarm reflected the sunlight. What a horrible place, shrilled Mrs. Milsom. We'll all die here. We'll never get back to Earth. I knew this would happen. This is certainly a mean spot to be cast away, muttered Captain Walls. God knows what queer creatures inhabit it, not to speak of the mysterious vestons everybody talks about. And John Dark and his crew are somewhere here. And the Taladio wrecked, so we can't call for help. Keniston realized that none of the others had glimpsed Dark's camp as they fell. They didn't know the pirate encampment was only a few miles away in the jungle. What are we going to do, Captain? 
Gloria was asking, her face still pale, but her voice quite steady. Can we get away? Captain Walls looked hopeless. We can't take off with the whole bow of the sun sprite crushed in. We can repair it, can't we? Hugh Murdoch suggested. Remember, in the hold is the cargo of machinery and repair materials that Kenistone was bringing to repair. Dark ship, can't we use that equipment? The captain looked more hopeful. Maybe we can. Bray and the crew and I ought to be able to do an emergency job of patching the bow and installing new rocket tubes there. But we'll have to work fast to get away before Dark's outfit learns we're here. He pointed vindicatively at Keniston. Better lock up that fellow and his partner to make sure he doesn't signal somehow to his fellow pirates. Keniston tried again to explain. Will you all listen to me? I tell you, I'm no pirate. Murdoch eyed him sternly. Do you deny that John Dark sent you to Mars for repair equipment? And that you told us that lying treasure story to get the equipment here in our ship? No, I don't deny that, Keniston admitted. But I'm not one of John Dark's crew, I never was. I was a prisoner on his ship, captured by the pirates before they themselves were attacked by the patrol. Do you expect us to believe that? Murdoch said incredulously. It's true, Keniston insisted. My kid brother Ricky and I were captured by John Dark's outfit several weeks ago. We were prisoners on his ship when it was wrecked by the patrol. After the wreck drifted onto Vesta here, Dark wanted to send someone to Mars for repair equipment. He wouldn't send one of his own men in charge, for fear the man would double-cross him and never come back. So he sent me, his prisoner, on that errand. Hoker came along to help me navigate a ship back. And I had to obey Dark and get the equipment back here at any cost. For Dark kept my brother Ricky prisoner here with him, and told me that if I didn't bring back that equipment, Ricky would be shot. Hoker spoke up, it's true, what Keniston's telling you, rumbled the Jovian. Me, I'm one of Dark's pirates and I don't care a curse who knows it. But Keniston did this only to save his brother. I don't believe it, said Captain Walls flatly. It's another of the smooth lies this fellow Keniston makes up so easily. Gee. Loria spoke to Keniston her dark eyes still accusing. If what you say is true and you're not a pirate, then you brought all of us into this danger simply to save your own brother. Keniston looked at her miserably. Yes, I did. I was willing to lead you all into capture to save Ricky. But I had a reason. Sure, you had a reason, Murdoch said bitterly. What did the safety of strangers like us mean to you, compared to your precious brother? Captain Walls motioned Keniston and Hook were angrily toward the ship. Bray, Take them in and lock them under guard in a cabin, he said. Hokor suddenly yelled. Look out, there's a Vestin. Keniston, his blood chilling with alarm, glanced where the Jovian pointed. At the west edge of the clearing, a small animal had suddenly emerged from the dense green jungle. It was a six-legged, striped cat-like beast, not an ordinary as interplanetary animals go. But its head looked queer, seeming to have a bulbous gray mass attached behind its ears. Captain Walls uttered a scoffing exclamation. That's only an ordinary asteroid cat. That is a Vestin, Keniston cried. Shoot at its head. His warning was too late. The cat-like beast had launched itself in a spring toward their group. As its striped body shot through the air, Walls triggered his atom pistol. The crackling blast of force tore into the body of the charging asteroid cat, and the beast fell heavily a few yards away. But as it fell, the small gray mass upon its neck suddenly detached itself from the dead animal and scuttled, swiftly forward. It moved with blurring speed toward Bray, the nearest to it of the group. The little gray creature was no bigger than a man's clenched fists together. It was a gray, wrinkled featureless thing, except for pinpoint eyes and the tiny claw-like legs upon which it scurried. It reached Bray and ran swiftly up his legs and back as he swore startledly. Keniston, made reckless of danger by his horror, yelled and lunged toward the pilot. Bray was swearing and trying to slap at the gray thing running up his back. But the little creature had now reached his neck. Clinging there, it swiftly dug to tiny, needle-like antennae into the base of his neck. Hold him, Keniston shouted hoarsely. The Vestin has got him. Bray had undergone a sudden metamorphosis as the gray creature dug its antennae into his neck. His face stiffened, became mask-like. The pilot turned and began to run stiffly toward the jungle. Keniston's leap almost caught him, but Bray lashed out a fist that sent Keniston sprawling. Don't let him get away, Keniston yelled, scrambling up. But the others were too stricken by amazement and horror to interfere in time. Bray had already plunged into the jungle and was gone. My God, what happened?
Captain Walls exclaimed dazedly. Bray went clean crazy. His gun was pointing at Keniston and Hokor, as though he held them responsible for what had occurred. He didn't go crazy, but he's lost now, Keniston said heavily. That little grey creature was one of the Vestons. But what did it do to him? That thing wasn't big enough to harm anybody. That's all you know about it, said Hoke or ominously. Those little Vestons are the most dangerous creatures in the system. The Vestons, Keniston added dully, are semi-intelligent parasites. They live by attaching themselves to and taking control of some other creature's body. They do it by jabbing in those tiny, needle-like antennae to contact the victim's nervous system. Thereafter, the Vestin controls the victim's body absolutely. When the victim dies or is hurt, the Vestin simply detaches himself and fastens upon a new victim. H. Aura was on the white faces of the others. Murdoch gulped and asked, then Bray. Bray is beyond saving now, Keniston said. The Vestin parasite will control his body till he dies. The Vestins always like to attach themselves to human beings. They know that a man's body is more versatile in its capabilities than an animal's. Twilight was beginning to descend upon the little clearing in the jungle, for the sun had gone down during the last few minutes. In the gathering dusk, the jungle loomed dark and brooding about them. Overhead, the sky of this world with a thousand moons was burgeoning into its full glory. The hundreds of meteor moons that spun across the heavens were shining brighter and brighter in the deepening dusk. Captain Walls broke the spell of horror and dread. We'd better get back inside the ship for tonight, he said nervously. We can't do anything about repairs until tomorrow, anyway. By then we'll have figured out some way to deal with those devilish creatures. Murdoch said bitterly to Keniston, Bray's end is your fault, Keniston. You brought him and us and these women into this place, all for the sake of that brother of yours. He'll stand trial for that when we get back to Mars, the captain vowed. Even if he wasn't one of Dark's crew originally, by helping them he's made himself a space pirate, liable to execution. Keniston made no attempt to defend himself. He knew they wouldn't understand why he had sacrificed them for Ricky's sake, even if he told them. He and Hoke or were locked in one of the little cabins, after it had been carefully searched. The crewman Thorpe was stationed as a guard outside their bolted door. Hokor, who had bandaged his burned arm, looked around the dark little cabin disgustedly. This is a devil of a fix to get into, swore the Jovian. Here we've reached Vesto with the stuff, but can't let the chief know. Keniston asked him earnestly, Hoke, would John Dark really shoot Ricky if I didn't deliver the equipment? He said he would, but you know he needs Ricky. Keniston was clinging to this last shred of hope for his brother. John Dark and his pirates did need Ricky. For Ricky was a physician, Dr. Richard Keniston of the Institute of Planetary Medicine. That was why John Dark had spared the lives of the two brothers. When he had captured them in the freighter in which they were returning to Earth from Saturn. Ordinarily, the pirate leader would have ruthlessly killed them. As he killed all prisoners who were not rich enough to pay ransom. But the fact that Ricky was a physician had saved them. The pirates needed a doctor. They had kept the two brothers prisoner on their ship for that reason. Keniston and Ricky had still been on the Falcon as prisoners, when the patrol had finally caught up to it and wrecked it. Dark knows that Ricky is a fine doctor and he needs a doctor, Keniston repeated hopefully, to the Jovian. Surely he wouldn't be foolish enough to shoot Ricky, even if I don't deliver the equipment. Keniston, don't fool yourself, warned Hokor. The chief said he'd shoot him if you weren't back with the stuff in two weeks, and shoot him he will. John Dark never breaks his word. That assurance sank the iron deeper into Keniston's tormented soul. If that was true, and he knew in his heart it was, Ricky would die two days from now unless he delivered the repair equipment to Dark. He mustn't let Ricky die. Too much depended on his young brother's life. He must save Ricky even if it did mean the capture of Gloria and the others by the pirates. Better that they be held for ransom, than for Ricky to be killed. K. Aniston got to his feet, rigid with decision. Then we've got to get out of here, he muttered. We've got to escape and take word to Dark that the equipment is here. He continued quickly, Hoke, Dark's camp is only a few miles north of here. I spotted it as the sun sprite fell. Hokor uttered an exclamation. Why the devil didn't you tell me so? I figured it was on the other side of the asteroid, maybe? and that we'd never find it in the jungle even if we did get away. It still won't be easy for us, Keniston warned. The Vestons may get us in the jungle between here and Dark's camp. And anyway, how can we get out of this cabin? 
The Big Jovian grinned. That'll be easy. I'd have been out of here before now. Only I was waiting for the ship to quiet down. Keniston stared. That door is bolted. And there's no tool or weapon in the cabin. They didn't forget a thing when they searched it. Hoker's grin deepened. They forgot one thing. They forgot how strong a Jovian is on a little, weak gravity asteroid like this. Chapter V Night Attack Keniston caught desperately at the hope implied by the Jovian's words. What do you mean, Hook? I mean that I'm a hundred times stronger on this little asteroid than I am on my own world, Jupiter. I can break the bolt of that door any time I want to. But there's an armed guard stationed outside it. I know, and that's where you come in, Keniston. When I rip the door open, you'll be ready to jump the guard. Keniston considered swiftly. The chance of their getting out of the ship and safely through the jungles to the pirate camp, even if they escaped this cabin, seemed a slim one. Yet it presented the only possibility of delivering the equipment in the hold to John Dark. The bitter irony of it struck Keniston, for the hundredth time. He, Lance Keniston, honorable spaceman for a dozen years, working desperately to aid the most notorious pirate in the void, even drawing into danger the girl for whom he felt. He shook Gloria out of his mind. He mustn't think of her now. He must think only of Ricky, and of what would be lost if Ricky died. He must risk everything, sacrifice everything, to prevent that loss. We might as well try it now, he told the Jovian in low tones. The ship seems quiet. I'll do my best to make as little noise as possible, Hokor muttered. Are you ready? The Jovian's big hands grasped the knob of the door. Keniston crouched a little behind him, every muscle tense. Hokor suddenly put all his gigantically magnified strength into a tremendous tug at the door. Its bolt snapped with a crack like that of a pistol shot, and it swung wide open. The man on guard outside turned startledly, his hand darting to the atom gun at his belt and his mouth open to yell. But Keniston had launched himself like a human projectile as the door was torn open. Keniston's fist smashed the space sailor's chin and the man sagged limp and unconscious with no chance to utter the cry on his lips. Hastily, Keniston took his atom pistol and eased him to the floor. He and Hoke or listened tensely. The single sharp crack of the snapping bolt had apparently aroused no one. The ship was silent, all aboard were sleeping exhaustedly. Come on, Keniston murmured tensely to the Jovian. We've got to hurry to get to Dark's camp before night is over. Hoke or chuckled. The chief will welcome us with open arms when he learns we've got the equipment here for him. Keniston gripped the atom pistol as they stole through the dark ship and out of the space door. Outside, they paused in the darkness. The scene was one of magic, an earthly beauty. The metal bulk of the cruiser and the towering jungle around the clearing were washed. By brilliant silver light that fell from the wonderful night sky of this world with a thousand moons. A thousand moons indeed seemed blazing in the canopied heavens overhead. The whole dark sky was crowded by the shining moonlets that rushed ceaselessly across the firmament with the spinning of the meteor swarm of which they were part. It was like the glorious vista of a world seen in dreams. But Keniston was familiar with the unearthly spectacle. He led the way rapidly toward the northern edge of the jungle. We'll just have to plunge in and head north, he told the Jovian. If we reach that little lake, we can soon find Dark's camp. They started into the dense jungle, a fairyland of silver beams sifting through the choking fronds. Something scurried close by. Keniston, shoot! cried Hokor instantly, K. Eniston had already glimpsed the white beast scurrying toward them across a little patch of moonslight. It was one of the big meteor rats. On its neck bunched one of the little gray masses, the Vestin. The horror inspired by the hideous parasites tightened Keniston's finger convulsively on the trigger of the atom pistol. The crackling bolt of fire from the weapon ripped into the Vestin on the meteor rat. And both parasite and animal victim were instantly a scorched, smoking heap. Hell, that's torn it, cried the big Jovian. We've roused the whole ship. Men awakened by the blast of the atom gun were pouring out of the sun's bright, rushing after the two escaped men. Keniston heard Captain Walls shouting. They're in the jungle here. Spread out and surround them, the officer was ordering. Keniston and the Jovian plunged forward, seeking to escape northward. But they had come up against an impenetrable abatis of brush. Before they could find a way around it, they heard men crashing all around them. They were completely encircled. Keniston, you and that Jovian walk back into the clearing with your hands raised or we'll blast every inch of the brush till we get you. Came the stentorian shout of the captain. 
The devil, they've got us boxed, exclaimed Hoke refuriously. We'll try to fight our way through. No, Keniston declared. We couldn't make it anyway. And I'm not going to shoot innocent men. Hokor angrily grabbed for the Adam pistol, but Keniston promptly threw it away. Not even in this last extremity could he bring himself to kill. You're a fool, gritted the Jovian. Now there's nothing for it but surrender. With their hands raised, they walked out of the jungle into the brilliant silvery light of the clearing. Instantly they were surrounded by Captain Walls, Murdoch and other armed crewmen. The girls and their scared chaperone, and young Lanning and Robbie Boone, were emerging in alarm from the sun's bright. Keniston did not look toward them. Captain Wall's face was grim in the moonlight as he and his men covered the two captured fugitives. Keniston, you and this Jovian were going to make your way to John Dark and tell him of our presence here, weren't you? You needn't deny it, it's plain enough. Sure we were, exclaimed the angry Jovian. We'd have made it, too, if a Vestan hadn't jumped us in the jungle. That would have meant capture of us all by Dark's pirates, said the captain grimly. You two are a danger to us all, while you live. I'm going to remove that danger. As master of a spaceship, I have legal right to order summary execution of any space pirates I capture. I'm going to order that now. You're going to kill them, exclaimed Gloria. Oh, no, you can't. It's absolutely necessary, before they betray us to the pirates, Miss Loring, defended the captain. They'd be sentenced to death by the courts if we took them back to Mars, anyway. But we daren't take a chance on keeping them prisoned that long. But just to shoot them down, said Gloria horrifiedly. I won't stand for that. Murdoch took her by the arm. It's space law, Gloria, he told her earnestly. You'd better go back into the ship. Keniston stood silent in the moonlight, for he realized from the finality of Wall's voice that appeals would be utterly useless. There was no use trying again to explain why he'd been willing to betray them all to save Ricky. Even if they listened, they wouldn't understand. He felt tired, crushed Wold. He'd gone a long way in the last dozen years, but every mile of it had only led toward this ending. He was going to die here under the hurtling meteor moons of Vesta, and that meant that Ricky and Ricky's dream were going to die soon too. I told you you were a fool to throw away that gun, Hokor was muttering. Why? They two march over there to the edge of the clearing, Captain Walls ordered grimly, gesturing with his gun. Anything you want to say first, Keniston? Nothing that you would listen to or understand, you people, Keniston answered dully. No, I've got nothing to say. A crackling voice came out of the dark jungle at that moment. I have something to say. Drop those guns, every man of you, and get your hands up. Walls spun around with an oath, leveling his atom pistol. But out of the jungle crashed a streak of fire that hit the captain's arm and sent him reeling. One of the girls screamed. Another of the Sun Sprite's crew had tried to aim his weapon and had been cut down by a second bolt of atomic fire that had hit his leg. I don't want to kill you unless you force me to, came that crisp voice from the darkness. You have ten seconds to drop the guns. That's the Chief Keniston, yelled Hoke or excitedly. It's John Dark himself. The dreaded name of the pirate, a synonym for cold ruthlessness, reinforced the threat from the darkness. Murdoch let his weapon fall and shouted, Drop the atom guns, men. If we tried to fight, the women will be hurt. The Sun Sprite's men dropped their atom pistols. Instantly out into the brilliant light from the jungle rushed a score of armed pirates. Martians, Earthmen, Venusians and others, this horde represented the criminal underworld of every planet in the system. In a moment they had those in the clearing completely disarmed and lined up against the ship. All except Hokor, who was loudly greeting his pirate comrades. Keniston saw John Dark coming across the moon-slick clearing toward them. The notorious pirate was a tall, bulky earthman, but he walked with the light-footedness of a cat in his moon shoes. His black hair was bare, and in the silver light his black-browed, intelligent face was coldly calm as his eyes searched the row of prisoners. So you finally got here, Keniston. What about the repair equipment? He asked sharply. Keniston nodded toward the sun sprite. It's in the hold. We got everything you listed. Good, Dark approved. We saw your ship crash landing today, and started this way at once. We've been beating through the jungle, fighting off the damned Vestans, until we heard the uproar going on here. What happened? Who are these people? Keniston explained briefly how he had induced Gloria Loring's party to come on a pretended treasure hunt. He was careful to stress the wealth of the party, and John Dark reacted as he had expected. If they're that wealthy, 
Their families can pay big ransoms. You've done very well, Keniston. What about Ricky? asked Keniston tensely. He's all right. Sure he's all right, he's up at the camp, Dark answered. Gloria said bitterly to Keniston, you can congratulate yourself. You've managed to save your brother. John Dark addressed her. Miss Loring, I presume you and your companions are willing to pay ransom for your crew also. I never take prisoners, unless they promise a good profit. Yes, of course we'll pay the ransom of the crew, Gloria agreed hastily. Good, said the pirate calmly. You'll not find your captivity any more irksome than necessary. Mrs. Milsom, the dumpy chaperone, was goggling at the notorious pirate in an extreme of terror. A sardonic gleam came into Dark's eyes as he glanced at her. You're a handsome wench, he told the plump dowager with mock admiration. I've half a mind to keep you and let the ransom go. No, no, shrieked the terrified woman. Dark burst into a roar of laughter. All right, my shrinking beauty, we'll accept ransom for you. He turned and shot efficient orders to his subordinates, who by now had gathered behind him. Get that stuff out of the hold, rig up power sledges, and start freighting it up to the camp. You'll have to cut a path through the jungle, use atom blasters to burn one out. One of the pirates, a hard-faced Martian, said uneasily, that will make a racket that'll bring every Vestin on the asteroid down on us. You can keep the Vestins off if you keep your eyes open, Dark retorted. Get to work, now. We've got to get the stuff up there and repair the Falcon at once. I'll take these prisoners up to camp. Keniston was grouped with the other prisoners. With a strong escort of armed pirates guarding them, and Dark and Hoke or ahead, they started through the jungle toward the pirate camp. Chapter VI Asteroid Horror The pirate encampment was a big clearing hacked from the jungle a mile west of the little lake. In this space lay the long, Looming black mass of the most dreaded Corsair ship ever to sail the void. The Falcon had been righted to even keel, but its crippled condition was evident in the fused, wrecked condition of its tail rocket tubes. The whole camp was enclosed and protected by a shimmering blue dome of electric force. This emanated from a heavy copper cable that completely encircled the clearing, and which drew its power from insulated cables that led into the ship to generators driven by the few cyclotrons still functioning. This protective electric wall had been set up at John Dark's orders to keep out the dreaded Vestans. John Dark raised his voice as he and his men with their prisoners approached the shimmering wall of the camp. Kin Ibo, drop the wall for us. They saw the hard-looking Martian who was Dark's second in command dive into the ship to turn off the power of the electric barrier. It died, and Dark's party entered the clearing. Then the electric wall sprang into being again behind them. Keniston looked swiftly around. There were a score more of the motley pirates here in the camp. Also, near the side of the looming black falcon, were the small, rough log huts that Dark's men had constructed. Dark's black eyes were triumphant as he told his Martian lieutenant, Keniston and Hoke, or brought back the equipment all right, and also brought some people who will bring big ransom. Their wrecked ship is a few miles south. You go down there with half the men here and help the others bring up the equipment. Can I bow? Looking a little apprehensively out at the jungle, obeyed. Dark motioned Keniston and the other captives toward one of the huts by the big ship. That hut will be your quarters until we get the Falcon repaired, declared the pirate leader. Any of you who try to leave it will be shot at sight. I hope you'll not be foolish enough to attempt escape. That's right, folks, you wouldn't have a chance, Hoker told them earnestly. Even if you could get out through the electric wall, the Vestans would get you. They're thick in the jungle around here. They silently entered the hut. Its broad open windows admitted enough of the dazzling moonlight to brighten its interior. A dark, eager-looking young earthman sprang up as they entered and rushed to pump Keniston's hand. Lance, you got back safely, he exclaimed. Thank the Lord, I've been worrying myself almost crazy about you. How about you, Ricky? Keniston asked his young brother anxiously. You're all right? Ricky Keniston nodded quickly. Sure, I'm okay but things haven't been so good here, Lance. The Vestans have got a half dozen pirates who ventured outside the wall in the last few days. These creatures literally haunt the jungles around here now. I think they've been drawn here from all over the asteroid. Ricky looked wonderingly at Gloria and the others who were entering the hut. Lance, who are all these people? Are they prisoners of Dark too? Yes, we're prisoners, Hugh Murdoch told him bitterly, with a savage glance at Keniston. 
We're prisoners because your brother sacrificed us all to get back here and save your neck. Lance, you didn't do that. Ricky exclaimed in distress. I had to, Ricky Keniston protested. It meant your life if I didn't. Of course, Murdoch agreed ironically. What importance are we compared to saving your young brother's life? Keniston spoke slowly, to Murdoch and Gloria and the others. It wasn't merely Ricky's life at stake that made me sacrifice you all. It was more than that. I tried to tell you before, but you wouldn't listen. K. Aniston went across the hut and brought back the square black medicine case of his young physician brother. He opened it, and out of the vials and instruments inside he took a square bottle of milky fluid. This is what I sacrificed everything to save, Keniston said simply. They all stared. What is it? Gloria asked, puzzled. It's Ricky's discovery, Keniston said. It's a preventative and cure for gravitation paralysis. Captain Walls, himself an old-time spaceman, was first of the group to appreciate the significance of the statement. The captain gasped. A preventative for gravitation paralysis. Keniston, are you sure? Keniston nodded gravely. Yes, Ricky had been working on the problem a long time. Back in the Institute of Planetary Medicine, he thought he'd found a way to prevent gravitation paralysis. The most awful scourge of all the outer system, the thing that's doomed so many spacemen. But his formula required rare elements found only in the outer planets. Ricky and I, he continued, went out there and secured those elements. He made up this formula and tried it on a gravitation paralysis case, a spaceman who's lain paralyzed for years. The formula was designed to strengthen the human nervous system against the shock of varying gravitations to re-establish an already damaged nerve web. And it worked. Keniston's voice was husky as he concluded. It worked, and that living log became a man again. The formula was a success. Ricky and I started back for Earth, where he intended to announce the discovery and range for its manufacture on a big scale. But, on the way back, Dark's pirates captured us. Keniston flung out his hand in a tortured gesture. That's why I went to any lengths to save Ricky's life. It's because Ricky is the only person who knows the intricate formula of this serum. If he were to die, the secret of the cure would die with him. And that would mean that thousands on thousands more of spacemen would be stricken into living. Death by gravitation paralysis in the future. Just as so many thousands of old friends and shipmates of mine have been stricken in the past. Captain Walls was the first to speak. Quietly, the plump master of the sun sprite extended his hand. Keniston, will you shake hands with me? And will you forgive me for everything? You did absolutely right. I'm an old spaceman and I know what gravitation paralysis is. Gloria's dark eyes were glimmering with tears. If we'd only known, she murmured to Keniston. No one could blame you for sacrificing a lot of worthless idlers like us for a thing like this. But you're going to be all right, all of you, Keniston assured her. John Dark will make you pay a big ransom, but you can afford that and you'll get back safely to Earth. Thank heaven for that, exclaimed Mrs. Milsom. I can't understand. All this scientific talk of yours, but I do know that that pirate chief means no good to me. Didn't you see the lustful looks he gave me? The laugh that greeted this lessened the tension. Keniston turned as Ricky plucked at his arm. What about ourselves, Lance? Ricky asked quietly. Dark still won't let us go, you know. He still needs me as a doctor. Hugh Murdoch stepped forward. Dark would let you both go, for a big enough ransom. I'd like to pay it for you. The handsomeness of Murdoch's gesture moved Keniston. He was only able to mutter his thanks. W. How Ricky was treating Captain Wall's burn arm. The officer kept looking fascinatedly at that square bottle of milky fluid. He said hesitantly, I've a son back on Earth. For five years he's lain in a cough from the gravitation paralysis that hit him out on Jupiter. Do you suppose? Ricky nodded. Yes, Captain. I'm sure that we can cure him, now. There was an uproar out in the clearing. Keniston went to the door and looked out. The electric wall had temporarily been dropped, and Ken Ibo and the main body of the pirates were hastily entering the camp with their improvised power sledges that bore heavy loads of machinery and materials. Keniston heard Kin Ibo reporting shrilly to John Dark. We lost two men to the Vestons on the way here, and nearly lost two more. All this activity has drawn them from all over the asteroid. Look at that. Outside the electric wall, which had been hastily re-raised, could be glimpsed the shapes of lurking asteroidal animals. Meteor rats, big striped cats, flame birds, 
and every one of those lurking animals, bore attached to its neck one of the little gray Vestin parasites. John Dark was saying harshly, we've got to have the rest of those materials to repair the falcon. I tell you, it'd be suicide to try another trip through those jungles, expostulated the Martian. Those Vestins are devils. Bah, you Martians are all alike, no good when your superstitions get aroused, snorted Dark contemptuously. I'll take the men down myself. Come on, men, unload those sledges and we'll go back to the wreck. His indomitable personality drove the scared, unwilling pirates into the task. Again the electric wall was faded out for a moment to let them out. When they returned some time toward morning, Keniston heard the crash of Adam Guns heralding their approach. And when the wall was momentarily dropped, John Dark and his men stumbled into the camp with their loaded sledges in sweating haste. Turn on the wall again, quick, bellowed Dark's bull voice. The jungle swarming with the Grey Devils now, they got five of us on the way back. Ricky, looking over Keniston's shoulder, spoke appallably. Good God, Lance, look at them. I didn't know there were so many Vestins. Outside the barrier of shimmering electricity, scores of animals and birds, dominated by the dreaded little gray parasitical creatures were now swarming, and their number seemed growing every minute. All this activity of the night has drawn the Vestins from far and wide, Keniston muttered. I don't like it. If that electric wall should fail, the creatures would be in on us in a moment. Dark himself seemed to feel something of the same apprehension for he was shouting urgent orders. Hook up those atomic welders, and start putting the new plates into the falcon's tail. Kin Ibo, have your gang fit in the new rocket tubes. I'll see to installing the new six. If we work, we can get the job done by tomorrow night and get out of here. Through the day, the pirates toiled with an energy that showed their earnest desire to leave the asteroid. That desire was reinforced by the ever larger number of vestins that now swarmed outside the wall. There were literally hundreds of the gray parasites now outside the barrier. To have tried going outside the wall now would have been sheer suicide. The creatures were apparently driven by an unholy eagerness to possess themselves of human bodies. Gloria, looking out with Keniston, shuddered deeply. This horrible world, it's like a nightmare. We'll soon be away from it, Keniston reassured. See, they've almost finished repairing the Falcon. T. The urgent toil of the pirates was showing results. By the time night came again, and the meteor moonlets blazed forth, with magic beauty in the dark heavens, the task of repair was almost done. Keniston and his companions had not ventured forth from the hut. Pirates were everywhere in the clearing, and all had heard John Dark's strict order to blast down the captives if they left their prison. But from the hut, Keniston and the others could see that the horde of Vestin-dominated animals around the camp had further increased. With ghastly avidity, they kept circling the shimmering, electric wall. Keniston turned in alarm at a ripping sound from the back of the log hut. Two of the logs were being torn out bodily. The battered green face and giant shoulders of Hoke or came through the opening. Keniston, I came in this way because I didn't dare let Dark see me talking to you, the Jovian exclaimed, his face was urgent in expression. I found out that Dark doesn't mean to let your friends here get away from Vesta alive. What? exclaimed Keniston, that's impossible. Dark said he was going to hold Gloria and the others for ransom. Hoke or nodded hastily, I know, and he meant it, then. But since then, he's found out something that's changed his plans. He found it out from me, like a big fool, I told him everything when he questioned me. The Jovian continued rapidly. I told him that Murdoch had sent that Teladio message back to patrol headquarters, asking about my record. Now Dark figures that the patrol will come out here to find out if that message meant that some of John Dark's outfit had actually escaped. Dark wants the patrol to keep thinking that he and his outfit were destroyed so he can slip out to Pluto and prepare a new base. So Dark, when he leaves here, is going to drop Miss Loring and her friends by the wrecked Sun Sprite. So the patrol will find them dead by the wreck and will believe their cruiser crashed accidentally. That way, they won't go on searching as they would if Miss Loring's party was all missing. And Dark will have a chance to get out to Pluto without an alarm going out. Keniston was suspicious. Why do you tell us this, Hook? You're one of the pirates yourself. I know, but I'm afraid Dark means to drop me with the others by the sun sprite, Hook or exclaimed. He didn't say so. But I believe he figures on doing it so that the Teladio inquiry about me would be. Explained when I was found dead with the others by the wreck. Murdoch said swiftly, the Jovian's right, Keniston. 
All this is just what Dark would do to hide his trail. Now that he knows my tell audio message may have aroused the patrol's suspicion. Hokor said emphatically, I'm with you if you can figure out any way to take the Falcon. Keniston. Keniston paced to and fro. His whole mind was suddenly in a wild turmoil of stark fears. This meant death for Gloria and the others, and the ultimate responsibility for that death would be his. There is one possible chance for us to take the Falcon, he muttered finally. But my God, it seems like an insane idea. Wait a minute, Captain Walls interrupted. Dark won't drop you and your brother to die, Keniston. He still needs your brother as a physician. You two will be safe even if we are killed. What of that? I can't let Gloria and the rest of you be murdered. I was willing to sacrifice you when I thought it was only a question of your being held for ransom, but this changes everything, Keniston said wildly. It doesn't change anything, the captain said firmly. Your duty is to keep your brother alive at all costs, to save that formula that means life and hope for thousands of gravitation paralysis victims like my son. You mean I should let you all be killed so Ricky and I can be saved? Keniston cried. I'm damned if I will. We'll never do that, Ricky Keniston agreed warmly. No formula in the world is worth that. This formula is, Gloria said earnestly to Keniston. The captain is right. I won't do it, Keniston repeated. I have an idea by which we might be able to take the Falcon. We're going to try it. Be reasonable, Keniston, pleaded Hugh Murdoch. None of us except Hokor has a weapon. What chance would we have against half a hundred armed pirates? K. Eniston looked at his brother. Ricky, your formula strengthens the nervous system against any form of shock or damage, doesn't it? You said it did it by sheathing the nerves themselves with an impenetrable coating. Ricky nodded puzzledly. Yes, that's the principle. But how is that going to help us? The Vestons, Keniston reminded, seize control of their victims. By inserting those tiny needle antennae of theirs into the victim's nerve system to establish contact. Wouldn't your formula insulate the nerves against such contact? Wouldn't it make a man immune to Vestan attack? Why, it would, Ricky declared wonderingly. I never thought of it, yet it's entirely logical. Then, Keniston said swiftly, I want you to give every one of us, including yourself, an injection of the formula right now. The driving purpose in his voice brushed aside all their bewildered questions and objections. Hastily, Ricky prepared his hypodermics and rapidly made an injection of the milky fluid into the big nerve centers in the neck of each of them. Keniston did the same for Ricky himself. We should be immune now to vest an attack, Keniston said prayerfully. But what good's that going to do us? Hoke or demanded, are you figuring to try and escape into the jungle? No, I'm figuring on taking the Falcon by using the Vestons, Keniston replied. Hoke, can you get into the ship and turn off the power that keeps the electric wall going? Can you drop the wall? The Jovian's jaw dropped. Why, sure, I could do that, but if I did, all those hordes of Vestons outside the wall will burst in here. He stopped, his eyes bulging. Good God, then that's your plan. To let the Vestons in. That's it, Keniston said tightly, his face grim. To let the Vestons in on the pirates. That'll give us a chance to take the ship if the formula really makes us immune to the Vestons. The terrible nature of the proposal stunned them all. But in a moment a flame of purpose lit in the Jovian's eyes. I'll do it, he swore. It's better than waiting for Dark to kill me like he's planning. You be ready? The Jovian slipped out of the opening in the back of the hut. They saw him presently, casually approaching the door of the Falcon. John Dark stood, a tall, dominant figure in the moonlight barking orders to the scores of pirates who were bolting in the last of the new rocket tubes. Keniston's eyes swung toward the shimmering electric wall and the horde of Veston-dominated animals outside it. The wall suddenly died, and as the electric barrier vanished, into the clearing came rushing the swarm of asteroidal animals. The wall's down, John Dark yelled, his atom gun leaping into his hand. Get back into the ship, get back. The crash of his atom gun drowned his own shout. Other pirates were firing wildly at the hideous creatures assailing them. For the little gray Vestons had detached themselves from their animal victims and were swarming upon the pirates, clambering with blurring speed up their legs and backs, sinking into their necks the tiny antennae. Keniston glimpsed John Dark with a hideous little gray bunch, now fastened to the back of his neck, drop his gun and stalk stiffly away toward the jungle. His face was an unhuman, lifeless mask, he was a human automaton 
dominated utterly by the alien creature. Come on, Keniston yelled to his friends. Now's our chance to get into the ship, T. Hey plunged out of the hut into the gruesome melee. Screaming pirates were now running into the jungle in vain effort to escape the hordes of Vestans. More than half the corsairs were now overcome. Keniston heard a scream from Gloria as they ran, felt a swift scurrying up his back. Then the needle-like stab of antennae sinking into his neck. But the parasitic creature did not overpower his will. He reached around, grasped and tore loose the hideous little thing, and with strong revulsion flung it to the ground. Your formula works, Ricky, we're immune to them, he gasped, but hurry. Other Vestans were clambering up on them like ghastly gray spiders as they ran, but were powerless to overcome them. They tore away the creatures and plunged on. Hoak or appeared in the door of the Falcon, his green face blazing as his atom pistol pumped crashing fire into pirates inside the ship. I've got the ship cleared of them, the Jovian shouted to Keniston. Let's get out of here. It was time they did so. Almost the last of John Dark's pirates had been possessed by Vestans, and had become parasite-dominated robots stumbling off into the jungle. The remaining swarms of grey creatures were scurrying toward Keniston's group. They tumbled into the Falcon and slammed shut the space door. The ship, completely if roughly repaired, was ready for takeoff. Captain Walls and the men of the Sun Sprite crew hastily started the newly installed cyclotrons while Keniston and the others raced up to the bridge. Keniston took the controls. He sent the big black pirate ship leaping up into the darkness upon flaming keel and tail jets. And then it climbed steeply toward the wonderful sky of countless rushing moonlets. By the time an hour had passed, the Falcon had groped out through the periodic break in the meteor swarm around the asteroid. And it was throbbing at steadily increasing speed out into the vault of space, away from the world with a thousand moons. We'll head for Mars, Keniston told the others. We can report there to the patrol. If you don't mind, Hoke or put in hastily, I'd just as soon you dropped me at some asteroid before then. I've no desire to meet the patrol. Captain Walls told the Jovian, nonsense. After what you've done, you'll get a full pardon from the patrol. You can count on it, Hugh Murdoch told the doubtful Jovian. We have some influence back at Earth. Well, I guess I'll have to go honest, then, sighed Hokor. All the real pirate outfits are gone now, anyway. He shook his head heavily as he walked away. The system sure isn't what it used to be. Captain Walls was asking Ricky earnestly, You're quite sure your formula will cure my son? All these years, I've hoped and prayed. I'm certain, Ricky smiled. Within a few weeks after we get back to Earth, gravitation paralysis will be a thing of the past. They moved off with the others. But Gloria lingered in the bridge with Keniston. Where will you be going after we get back? She asked him quietly. Oh, back to space, he answered, a little uncomfortably. There's nothing to hold me on Earth now that Ricky's work has succeeded. Nothing to hold you on Earth. Gloria repeated. That, I would say is about the most ungallant speech on record. He flushed. You don't mean, that night on the sun sprite, you weren't in earnest, surely. Your passionate proposal is accepted, Gloria said calmly. Keniston was aghast, but I didn't propose, I mean I do love you, and you know it. But you're an heiress, and I. We'll have all the way back to Mars to argue that out, she told him. And I have an idea you'll lose. Keniston had the same idea. The End